Hello and welcome to another edition of Expert Talks Online, where we aim to bring you insight, learning and discussion from real world technology specialists. I'm Matt Hyatt, I'm an Agile Delivery Consultant with Equal Experts, and I'm going to be your host for about the next hour or so. Tonight, we welcome Akash Askilun, who is a senior software engineer in the Guardian's developer experience team. Akash is someone that I've seen speak previously, and I'm really excited to learn more about what his team's been up to um, over the past couple of years. Welcome, Akash. How are you doing? Okay, thanks. Um, and hi, everyone. So this evening, Akash is going to tell us how The Guardian is making use of streamlined infrastructure management to enable its digital teams to add value at lightning speed. After the talk, we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A, which in my experience is only ever as good as we make it. So please do contribute with questions and we'll do our best to get through them at the end. If you'd like to ask a question, um, you can do so at any time by using the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of the screen rather than the chat, if that's OK. Um, and we'll be answering the questions in order of votes. So keep an eye on what questions are being added and vote for the ones that you'd most like to see answered. I think that's about it. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Akash. Over to you. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. Um, hoping you can still see my, my presentation. Um, excellent. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, my name is Akash. I'm a senior engineer at The Guardian. I've been, I joined The Guardian in, in 2015 um, and I've been working on a number of projects, primarily within our edit editorial tools team, which is an internal team building CMSs for our journalists. Uh, and then since mid 2020, I've been working on our developer experience team, um, specifically within the operations sub team um, of DevX. And today, I'd like to talk to you about what does DevX do um, at, at The Guardian? Uh, and I'll be covering some of our tooling, um, uh, what we see as the team's responsibility, um, and what the future looks like. And this talk isn't especially focusing on um, or promoting a, a certain way of thinking or working. It's mostly an opportunity to share the great work that we've, that we've been doing at The Guardian. So, what does, the, what does the DevX team do? In order to answer this question, we should look a little bit to the past. So some, some of you may know, The Guardian was founded, was, or rather well, the first published in 1821. And we've recently celebrated our 200, 200th anniversary. Oh, um, and in 1999, we had our, our web presence. Uh, our, well, we started our web presence. Uh, and during that time, we ran our own physical hardware um, in, and had a dedicated web ops team uh, maintaining that. And this team built libraries, creating paved, paved rows for configuration, telemetry, and more. They were also responsible for deploying um, our code, which back then happened at a fairly low frequency. And in 2012, uh, we began our move to AWS. The main reason for moving to it from self-hosted to, uh, to AWS was speed. The speed at which, at which you can provision new hardware in AWS can't be matched um, in a self-hosted environment. Being able to quickly provision new infrastructure allowed teams to innovate at a greater rate. And by 2015, um, we were solely on AWS and had, a, and had fully embraced continuous delivery with teams deploying multiple times a day. To emphasize this a little bit more, in the whole of 2012, we made just 25 releases. And in 2014, that number had increased to 40,000. So why does this matter? Well, let's talk a little bit about what we've, about our teams um, and, and our department. So we have autonomous teams. Um, we have roughly 100 engineers um, or 100 people in, in their department. Um, and we have a number of teams working on various projects of various um, generations and for different purposes. And our teams are fully autonomous meaning they, they are empowered to define their own ways of working. And we believe this has allowed us to deliver high quality products, such as an award-winning website, and also a massively successful reader revenue platform. And our autonomous, our, our autonomous teams have produced amazing work with a variety of technologies. Um, whilst it's, it's most common to find a Scala play app with a React front end, 
you will also find TypeScript lambdas, set functions, and even the odd use of ECS. Our data sources are also numerous, so we, we, we use DynamoDB, Elasticsearch, Postgres, among others. So this is all to say the move to AWS came at a slight cost too. Whilst teams were able to experiment and innovate at a faster rate, we, we now have a, a fair amount of fragmentation. So if we go back to our timeline, um, a developer experience was recently formed to improve on this. Um, so pr and prior to July 2020, um, our DevEx efforts were part-time, with individuals working about one day a fortnight alongside their main team. So back to our question, what does the DevEx team do? We have three areas of focus, client-side security and operational tooling. And we, um, we have a mission statement um, to uh, the aim of our team is to allow our, our engineers to focus on delivering value at speed. For example, building a world-class website or industry-leading editorial tools. And predictably, uh, we achieve this with a collection of tools. Um, there are quite a lot of tools um, and they focus on various areas. Um, I won't be going over all of them today because there's far too many. Um, but I would like to start with, with one of them, and that's Janus. So Janus is a tool um, that exchanges Google authentication for AWS credentials. At The Guardian, we have dozens of, of Amazon accounts. We also, need, we also have a need to grant varying degrees of access to these accounts. And whilst we could use permanent credentials to provide access, they, they're a bit difficult to rotate, they're difficult to revoke, and the story when someone leaves a company is fairly complicated. The credentials that Janus issues are temporary, typically last until the end of a working day. They're also easy to revoke. And when someone leaves, we can be sure that the, the access to AWS is removed as their Google account is closed. Janus is, has a very simple permission model and it's all tracks in VCS. So for example, this screenshot shows my levels of access to the deploy tools and content API accounts. I'm able to read CloudFormation in both of the accounts, and I can also invoke API gateways in the Content API account. Having access levels in source control means we have a, an order trail too in the form of, of pull requests. So the next tool I'd like to talk about is SSM Scala. So this is a CLI tool that exchanges AWS credentials issued by Janus, as we just mentioned, um, for access to our, to our service. At The Guardian, we have recently disabled direct SSH on two instances on port 22. And instead of, instead of direct SSH, we use SSM System Manager, so AWS System Manager, to create short-lived RSA keys, allowing our developers to connect to an instance. But why, why, why is this important? Well, prior to um, SSM Scala, we, um, we were sharing a, a one single um, PEM file across, across the team. Um, so one file to access, one, one key to access all our servers. And this has fairly obvious drawbacks. So namely, what happens when a member of staff leaves? Um, do, we, do we rotate that key? And how do we um, make sure that um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's kept up to date? And also, what happens if we accidentally leak, leak that key? Um, we need to make sure that we rotate it in all the right places. And, as SSM Scala requires AWS credentials, um, uh, we were able to, and, and as these credentials are managed by Janus, we can um, we have more confidence that no malicious actors can gain access to our servers. So the next tool is Riffraff. Uh, Riffraff is a tool is one of our oldest tools. Um, indeed, it was it was around the, the period of migration from on-prem to AWS that it was actually created. It, and it provides a single uniform way to, to deploy to both environments, so both AWS and on-prem. And today, Riffraff is used to deploy to EC2, S3, Lambda, CloudFormation, and more. It offers continuous deployment and also scheduled deployments. And this means that the feature, uh, that, sorry, and this means that once a feature branch is merged to main, Riffraff does the rest of the job and, and it will, your code will get deployed. So I mentioned earlier that we adopted continuous delivery around 2014 with 40,000 deployments a year. The number today is around 50,000, so that's roughly 130 deploys a day. 
and RIFRAF keeps a, uh, a record of these deployments. Uh, and with this history, we can, we can see which build was released when. So if we suddenly experience errors, we can easily correlate them um, to a specific build and roll back pretty, pretty quickly. But that's not the biggest benefit of RIFRAF. Um, the biggest benefit um, is it allows any engineer to deploy any application to any environment. So for example, in this screenshot, I am starting to, to deploy to the garden.com, uh, sorry, to the code version of the garden.com. I don't need any direct access to that Amazon account. Um, and it means that those on support router um, also have one less thing to worry about. Um, and finally, it, it also allows um, anyone to contribute to um, project outside of their direct team um, because they can make a code change, raise a PR, um, and they can deploy their build to code um, relatively quickly. Next is Source. Um, Source is our design system. Um, it's primarily aimed at producing a uniform experience across all Guardian properties, so the Guardian websites and the Guardian iOS and Android apps as well. The next tool is Prism. Uh, Prism is an API that captures information on infrastructure across our estate in near real time. Um, it's, it collects data on all of our EC2 servers, um, S3 buckets, lambdas, and many more um, AWS services. Um, and it's also used by a number of our other in-house tools. It also has a CLI, allowing us to quickly find resources across our estate. It's incredibly useful because AWS doesn't offer um, any kind of cross-account service discovery tool similar to this. Um, so one example of, of Prism being, being really helpful is we recently had a, a need to find all RDS instances, so the Amazon Relational Database Service. We, we, we needed to find all RDS databases running a certain version of Postgres because it was coming to the end of life and we had to upgrade it. And Prism made it really simple. So we, all we had to do was um, issue a, go to a URL and say uh, database engine equals the, the number and the, the, the response was instantaneous. Compare that to the alternative where we'd have to log into every single Amazon account, go into the um, RDS console, and then try to find um, all the different instances across all the different regions as well. So, so that's a brief look at the history uh, or the past rather. What's next? So when we, when we formed as a full-time team in 2020, we identified three areas of focus and for the operate, sorry, some areas of focus and for the operations teams, uh, this was observability, the runtime environment, configuration and deployment. And we believe that, that creating paid roads in these areas will allow our teams to achieve our mission of, an, of them focusing on delivering business value quickly. So, how does that actually work in practice? Today, this is taking the form of Guardian CDK. Guardian CDK is infrastructure as code. When we think about infrastructure as code for AWS, we typically think about CloudFormation. And if you're not familiar with CloudFormation, it's a YAML or JSON file that, that lets you declare the state of your infrastructure, anything from creating S3 buckets to IAM roles and policies um, to EC2 servers and auto scaling groups. CloudFormation is really great because it allows you to track your infrastructure in VCS um, and it also makes your infrastructure repeatable. So if you wanted to spin up your stack in a different Amazon region, you take a template, you upload it to that cloud to CloudFormation in that region, and then and then away you go. But there are some negatives. So CloudFormation is written in JSON or YAML. Um, in the case of JSON, it can quickly become big and bloated and hard to reason about. And YAML um, is sensitive to white space. So this means a feedback loop is, can be quite long. So you, a typical feedback loop is you write your template, you upload it to the Amazon console and hope that it's well formed. So your indentation in YAML is correct. You wait for Amazon to execute the, 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 your changes. And then you find out that it fails because for example, you either typoed a resource or you, did, did, you did, didn't define a policy correctly. And then you have to wait for Amazon to roll back that stack change. And then you start the whole process again. And it's a bit laborious. It's also frustrating and can result in, in sometimes granting over generous permissions because it just wants to get something working. 
So for example, rather than restricting your IM policy to a specific, um, a specific service, you, you, you could end up doing allow star essentially. So to combat this, it's not unreasonable to copy and paste from a well-known uh, template um, from a different app, but this also has drawbacks. So can you be sure that your template you're copying from is following the latest best, best, practice, um, best practices? Um, and how, do you, how can you be sure that you're evolving your template with best practices as they kind of evolve over time as well? So Guardian CDK um, is a, aims to solve most of those, most if not all of those issues. It's a node library written in TypeScript and it offers strongly typed thoroughly tested pay, um, a thoroughly tested paved road for Guardian inf infrastructure. It will codify today's best, best practice and it also provides a simpler story for keeping up to date with this best practice because you just update a node library. And it also guarantees to produce valid cloud formation on the very first attempt, which is, at least for me, unheard of. Um, so uh, in practical terms, um, it looks something like this. So here we're creating some infrastructure to run an application on EC2 within the auto scaling group and behind a load balancer. This is um, a handful of lines of code. Um, I should have put line numbers, I think roughly about 30 lines of code. Um, the comparative uh, YAML file is a couple of, maybe 150 to 200 lines. And you might notice that we also specify alarms here. Um, so that's to say, Guardian CDK provides observability out of the box. Lastly, uh, you'll notice the absence of tricky security groups or encryption options. And this is because Guardian CDK handles that all for you. It encodes the Guardian's best practice of security groups. So for example, it will never open port 22. So uh, Guardian CDK provides a paved road for declaring the, um, infrastructure that follows best practice. But back to the original question, what does the DevX team do? I think we can maybe answer this with an observation. At The Guardian, we have dozens of, of Amazon accounts used by autonomous teams in various ways. The tools we have today makes it easy to administer these accounts in centralized spaces. And the tooling we're building for the near future is aimed at removing body plate, providing a simple paved path um, to following best practices. And by doing so, teams can focus on experimenting, innovating, and delivering value quickly with increased confidence. Thank you. All the projects mentioned today are on GitHub in public repos. Please take a look if you're interested. We're also hiring, so if you have any friends that might be interested, please let them know. Thanks again, and I would love to take any questions. Uh, Akash, thank you. That was an awesome talk. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, to get into the q and I, I know there's loads. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, yeah, we have we have a couple of questions in already. Um, if anyone has any more questions, please please add them to the Q and A section, and please do vote on the ones that you want us to to tackle, and I'll, I'll post them to Akash as we go along. But yeah, get typing. Um, so we've got one question uh, first off. What's the scariest or highest profile outage that the team has had to cope with, and what did you learn from it? Um... So we're quite lucky because any outages that we experience um, are internal. Um, so all of our, our tools aren't, aren't kind of seen by readers, for example. But maybe I can maybe talk about an, an outage at The Guardian in general. Um, so possibly the biggest and most recent is when Fastly had their recent, most recent issue. Um, so I think I'm right in, in kind of the, the background where um, Fastly had a customer that made a change to their VCL, and that meant that kind of had knock-on effects to everyone um, in, on the Fastly um, platform. Um, so essentially, the Fastly CDN was was kind of out of service, which meant no one could reach the Guardian because that's our CDN um, uh, at the moment. Um, and the way we cope with that, um, there's not there's not really much you can you can do at that point. Um, it's kind of um, incident management and also just waiting for Parsi to kind of fix fix the issue. Um, we were somewhat lucky in that um, 
a lot of our competitors also use Fastly. So um, uh, yeah, any impact that we had, they were, they also seen. So we weren't, I don't know, maybe it's not the right thing to say, but we weren't really losing much much readers to, to our competitors. Um, but yeah, other kind of incident, incidents. Um, uh, so all of our, most of our internal tools um, are backed by Google Auth. Um, so that's to say, um, we, uh, you, have to have, you have to have a Guardian Google account uh, to use our, use our tools. Um, and Google Auth can sometimes also go down. Um, and so we've seen that quite a few times within editorial tools. Um, and to combat that, we've kind of built workarounds. Um, so if we see that Google Auth has gone down, um, we've got an emergency cookie um, issuer, essentially. So when Google Auth goes down, we turn a switch, we flick a switch to enable this emergency cookie mode. Um, and then um, uh, and then our editorial users, or, uh, yeah, uh, our, our colleagues in the editorial um, department can visit a URL that will drop a cookie and then they can continue using our tools and publishing, to, um, publishing content. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a mix between um, kind of the scar most scariest high profile outage was um, fastly going down because yeah, we could publish all we wanted, but um, no one could actually read it because and we couldn't really do much about it because it's off platform. Yeah, that certainly resonates resonates with me as well. The teams that I've I've worked in, I think we live in fear of uh, CDN outages or AWS AZs going down. That's the other, that's the other one that seems to take us out. Um, cool. Next question: uh, How do developers react to having to use abstractions on top of AWS services rather than direct access to underlying ones? Yeah, um, so we are, we've, we've just started our uh, migration process. Um, so um, we're getting teams to adopt CDK um, and um, stopping using YAML. Um, that experience so far has been really positive. Um, the, the main reaction has been, this has saved me so many, so many months of YAML, this is amazing. Um, I don't have to think about um, what best practices anymore. Um, but there's also that element of um, like, what, what is this actually gonna, gonna create in my account? Um, and so to combat that, we've, um, we've got extensive documentation. So um, when you go to, like in your IDE, if you were to say new Guardian app, um, it will kind of tell you um, do some doc strings. So this will create X, Y, Z, and for these reasons. Um, and the repo is also um, kind of open to, well, it's an open repo, and it's also um, available for other engineers in the department to contribute to. So if they kind of if they work out that um, a certain uh, decision um, isn't quite right, um, they can raise the PR and we can merge it in, and um, it will kind of get updated everywhere. Um, so the reaction, I guess, is um, it, uh, so far it's been really, 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 really positive, and that's mainly because um, like you don't have to, you don't have this horrible um, uh, feedback loop of right thinking that you've written valid cloud information, and then when you go to execute it. 10 minutes later, you get an error from Amazon saying, yeah, this, this failed, um, try again, essentially. Cool, thank you. Uh, next question, how do you see the difference between DevX and classic infra at the Guardian? Classic infra being a platforms team? No, yeah, and we've got another question about uh, in a similar realm as well, but yeah, take, I guess, interpret it as you will. Okay. So my understanding of platform, a platform team is um, they kind of own and operate um, the, the, the heart of well, the, the infrastructure, so all the servers and everything, and they can, they provision um, all your, your, all of the infrastructure. Um, and that, that, that kind of works because um, uh, as an like, as a engineer on a, on a feature team, essentially, um, you don't have to think about it. You just write your code, uh, merge it, and then magic happens and it, and it goes live. Um, but one drawback of that is if you want to experiment, so let's say um, you want to use Kinesis streams or SNS topics or or, or step functions or something, um, the platform team have to have, have to be supporting that that service um, for you to use it. Um, so there's a bit of a bottleneck there. Um, so the alternative, which what uh, which is kind of what we've um, employed with, uh, is. Um, teams are able to use and manage their own Amazon account. Um, so if they want to experiment with a shiny new service that's just been announced, um, they can. Um, I think the, the only kind of restriction we have is um, 
keep an eye on your spend. Um, if it goes too high, then um, yeah, we need to kind of um, like either re um, reserve things so it's a little bit cheaper or turn, start turning things off. Cool, thanks Akash. Um, Lino, I hope that answered the question, but if, um, if it didn't, please feel free to, to repost or add some more. Um, question for Ben, how do autonomous teams track resource use or costs where each team controls their own AWS resources? We just talked about that, but yeah. Yeah, so we, um, uh, we, we've got, we, we got um, uh, areas to improve on this, but um, we, we have a, uh, a dashboard of um, our, that tracks our monthly spend. Um, and it's a dashboard that kind of tracks spend versus our allocated budget. Um, and the reason why I say we need to improve is um, uh, if we exceed our budget, um, no one really screams. Um, so um, that's, that's probably an area to improve. Um, um, but yeah, uh, teams um, have uh, started to experiment with, um, I think it's like the, the budget, um, it's a budget budgeting service in, in Amazon. So you can say, I expect this account to, um, to uh, or rather, um, you, uh, I'm, I can't remember exactly what the service is called, but, um, uh, AWS will say historically your your monthly spend is I don't know a thousand dollars or whatever it is. Um, if they suddenly see a massive spike, then they'll send they'll send an, an alarm, um, and then you can kind of react that way. Um, yeah. So um, how do we track resource use? Um, I think it's, it's just up, up to teams to um, kind of um, find find ways. Um, yeah. I can find out more actually, more, more detail about that. Cool. Um, yeah, one question we might touch on a little bit already. Um, what were the considerations when weighing up whether or not to have a dedicated platform infrastructure team? Was it just about the pace of, um, you know, I'm not standing in the way of teams being able to do things themselves? Were there other things that you considered as well? Um, yeah, um, I think so. Pace was was one of them, um, and uh, consistency was another one. Um, so, um, if we think back to um, when GDPR legislation was was coming in, um, so one of those one of those rules is, um, I think I'm right in, in saying this is um, you have to be when a security patch is released, you you have 14 days to apply it to be compliant with the GDPR rules. Um, so. Uh, at that time, um, that was kind of like, uh, because teams were implementing uh, or like creating provisioning rather uh, Amazon resources in different ways. Um, there wasn't like one sand a bit of like, one, there wasn't like a coast that you can copy and paste into your cloud permission template. Uh, and then it just works. You had to um, kind of really understand what your stack is doing. Um, and that kind of, that made, that made um, like compliance of that, that rule um, a bit difficult. Um, and uh, longer than it probably should have, should have taken, or could have taken rather. Um, so if we can contrast that with what CDK is trying to achieve, um, all of those uh, rules and kind of like requirements essentially will be encoded in the library. Um, so in order to stay up to date with those um, those best practices, um, we will we'll publish a new version of the library, uh, and then teams will either get like a, a depender bot PR or something um, raise and um, saying like you're on version 10, uh, the latest version is version 11, um, here's a PR to update it. Uh, and then if they're happy, they can just merge it. And, and then all of a sudden they are adhering to best practice. Um, so that, that, that story is so much easier than um, like a, a widespread email saying like, here's the thing that you need to do, um, please do it. Um, and um, uh, you have kind of this, this deadline. Um, I, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it definitely does. And again, it, it, the clients I'm in at the moment, certainly working with HMRC and keeping the entire estate uh, up to date in terms of in terms of versions of various different products is yeah, one of one of certainly our biggest challenges. So yeah, that really resonates. Um, yeah, next question. Are you supporting any languages in addition to Scala and I guess in frameworks in addition to Play and anything in that, that technical space? 
Yeah, um, so we've we've got a um, uh, our default kind of stance on this is um, use whatever technologies um, are best suited for the job. Um, uh, but we also kind of slightly caveat and say um, the code that you write and that, that you ship to production should be maintainable by by others. So there's always that that balance of do I use um, like a really um, uh, obscure language um, that normal in department really really knows about um, just to kind of like either learn it or um, uh, or for other reasons um, and then so then two years down the line when when that's like getting loads of traffic is and we need to add more features is really hard to maintain um, do we do that or do we um, kind of uh, you, uh, use a framework or language that um, is is most familiar familiar with the department, um, but yeah, we we um, as a department we we yeah it's very much a use whatever tool um, helps you achieve uh, um, solve the goal essentially. So there's a chance that you end up with quite a few snowflake apps that might bite you further down the line. Yeah. Um, uh, as an example, um, we have, oh, is this, I think it's a public repo, so it should be fine to talk about. Um, we have, um, uh, so one of the apps in our, in our crossword publishing um, process is a Python app. Um, and uh, Python isn't, isn't a massive language, massively familiar language in the department. Um, so debugging any issues that, um, in the app um, can take um, uh, quite, quite a long time. Um, and it's also like we we haven't added any uh, many features to it over over the time either. Um, yeah. Yeah. Always, it's a really interesting question. This this uh, philosophical debate between, um, I guess, consistency versus uh, innovation and getting that balance between the two. I don't I, I, I don't think there's a there's a right answer. It's so dependent on context and yeah. So it's a, always a difficult one. Uh, um, but it, uh, even then, um, so um, if we were to look at our use of TypeScript, um, so um, maybe uh, four, four or five years ago, um, our typical stack was Scala Play with 12 templates and maybe a sprinkle of JavaScript here and there. Um, and then we kind of started, so we slowly started adopting TypeScript. Um, and at the same time, we're also adopting Flow um, for just uh, for type checking in, in JavaScript. Um, and over time, we kind of, uh, like we kind of learned, okay, uh, flow isn't really suited um, uh, for the problems that we're trying to solve. And types is kind of, it's kind of the way to go because it, it's, it gives you so much more confidence uh, in the code that you're writing versus JavaScript where kind of, yeah, it's JavaScript. Um, so yeah, that in that that's maybe maybe a good example of something where we like a new language that we we didn't really have met any experience in in the Guardian, and over time we, we slowly kind of um, either through um, like like learning groups um, or um, like pairing and and and, um, and going to conferences and stuff, um, we we slowly started um, writing more and more types of apps at the Guardian as well. Cool. Next question. Uh What's been the impact to the business since you've moved from a handful of deploys a year to 50,000? That's a, such a massive change. Um, has it changed the way that the business works? Um, so I'll caveat my answer and say I joined just as we completed the move to AWS. Um, so I don't have too much context of, um, kind of uh, prior to, to Amazon. Um, so I think like the, the, the main benefits is like the standards kind of continuous delivery to benefit. So you have increased confidence that you're, um, uh, because you're, you're shipping so often, you have increased confidence that what you're, what, what you are shipping, um, is going, is, is kind of reliable because, um, uh, because your changes, your changes are small, um, you, it's, it's, it's easier to kind of, um, sorry. I'm making a mess, of, mess of this answer. Um, because uh, with continuous delivery, you're shipping so on often. Um, you know that uh, it's easy. It's easier to kind of pinpoint any errors because you can say, "Hey, okay, this change just just got released. It I don't know changes the changes how we issue cookies, um, and now we kind of see seeing that login is now broken. 
So let's revert that and let's, um, well, let's roll, roll that change back uh, and then um, kind of move forward. Um, so how has it changed? Um, it's more that we've we've got more confidence in the in the code that, that we're that we're shipping. Um, so rather than kind of bundling two months of work into one big big deploy, uh, we deploy as and when it's ready. Um, Sorry to jump in. Do you find the business has more confidence in in digital as well? So certainly in in, in my experience, where I've seen that evolution from you know large scale business events, whether it's a you know a new product that's launching or you know an annual business peak that that's happening that's dependent on a platform or, or whatever it is, I've I've seen the, the the change previously in the way that the business interacts with with technology or, or digital and the amount of um, kind of rigor and fuss that goes around these sorts of things. And I wonder whether that that's an, an area that um, is different or feels different. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I, I don't have any experience of what it was prior uh, to, to the 40,000, now 50,000 um, releases. Um, um, yeah, I can, I can, I can ask. Um, uh, older people, uh, people with more more years at the Guardian than myself. We need to get we need to get an old timer for Guardian, a uh, Guardian lifer. Um, next question: How much does the DevX team have? Uh, how much time does the DevX team have to spend thinking about AWS access for engineers on the digital teams? And would those engineers ever put up with it being taken away? Um, I don't quite understand the question. Sorry. Um, how much time does DevX team have to spend thinking about AWS access for engineers? Um, I don't quite understand. It, this might be a question around Janus. Possibly. Yeah, is it about managing managing that access for the engineers? I don't know whether yeah there was that part of, uh, about the Janus tool earlier on in your um, okay. in in your press. Has that taken the pain away having that tool? So you yeah. To um, so Janus offers um, so. The Janus repo uh, is uh, available for anyone in the department to contribute to. Um, and the main kind of file that gets changed is a file called access.scala. Uh, and that essentially has a, it's, it's a big map of um, uh, uh, user ID and then permission levels. Um, so if you do have your access, if you do need uh, to elevate your access, you can raise a PR to update that, that mapping. Um, and then all you all we need to do is get approval from the team who owns that account that you're trying to get access to. Uh, and similarly, if you're um, if you get your access kind of um, downgraded or, or revoked, um, you'll get you'll, you'll get pings on the PR as well. Um, so you you get, actually know what's happening. Um, and the kind of main, uh, the the more typical kind of flow is um, you would raise a PR to elevate your, your access um, and kind of justify why. And then you'll also raise a PR to remove your access as well because you no longer you know, no longer need it. Um, yeah. And Jane, Janus presumably is um, in the open, available open source. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And is most of is most of your code in the open? Yes. Uh, yeah. So our, our default stance is to um, is the code in the open. We we do have some some private repos, um, uh, but they're more um, around like. Just protecting IP essentially, um, uh, or uh, or kind of platform um, platform things. Um, but yeah, all of our code, it, most of our code is in public repos, um, and yeah. Um, last time I checked, there's about two thousand repos on the Guardian organization on GitHub. Um, so maybe you look at the most at, the most like recently recently updated ones. Um, Nice. So yeah, go to go to the Guardian repos on GitHub to check check them out if anyone's interested in those tools. I think I think that's the end of the questions. So I just want to say, Akash, thank you so much um, for taking the time to to see us this evening and for the brilliant talk and for answering all the questions. Um, it, yeah, it's been awesome, a real insight into what your team's doing, and yeah, I think you answered uh, very ex expertly some. Pretty tricky questions around um, yeah, philosophical uh, arguments uh, within DevOps and infrastructure space. So thank you. Thanks for your time. You're welcome.
So thanks to everyone for their questions and everyone else in the audience as well. Uh, I hope you found this session really useful. Obviously, thanks again to Akash for the brilliant talk. Um, we'd like, we'd like to invite you all back for our next Expert Talks Online, which is going to feature the Product Director and Director of Engineering from Aways, who are going to talk to us about how automation and an accelerated digital journey are transforming experiences for their customers. And you can find the details on the Equal Experts website under the Experts, on, Experts Talk Online tab, together with all the previous recordings. Uh, from our sessions that have happened already. Please do register um, if you're interested in, in the future sessions and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much.